Hello everybody, welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 4 on the Abdomen, our Lecture 2 on the Enteric Nervous System. So the Enteric Nervous System is a integrated nervous system that innervates the GI and the GI related structures. It is a highly complex system of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. It has the ability to work alone or has the ability to work with the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. It is because its ability to work with or without and then because of the large number of neurons and synaptic interfaces that many people consider the enteric nervous system to be the human's second brain, and sometimes even having a mind of its own. Before we discuss the enteric nervous system in its entirety, first let's go ahead and discuss the GI tract wall. So the GI tract wall is composed of the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis propria. There's also a serosa or adventitia that is located on the outside of the GI tract wall, but that it may be present or absent depending on locations in the GI. First, you have the mucosal layer, which surrounds the lumen like this. It's composed of the epithelium, and then underneath it is the base of membrane and the lamina propria, and then following that is the muscularis propria. Then you have this green structure right here, and this is your submucosa, which houses the Meissner's plexus. Beneath that, you have your muscularis propria, which is composed of the inner circular, and then you have the outer longitudinal. In between these two layers, you have the myenteric plexus. It's also important to note that this system of smooth muscles in the muscular propria is not continuous throughout the whole GI tract. Actually, in the upper esophagus, you actually have skeletal muscle that allows for voluntary contraction of the esophagus during swallowing. It's also important to note that the stomach itself does not have just two layers of inner and outer muscular, it has three layers. Interestingly enough, it's this inner layer as well that actually forms two sphincters in the GI tract. One is the pyloric sphincter, and the other sphincter is the internal anal sphincter. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss the sympathetic nervous system in relation to the GI tract. So the sympathetic innervation often arises from the region of this intermediate spinal cord from T1 to L2. There may be some variation in how people cite the, the termination of the intermediate horn at L1, L2, L3, but for the purposes of our lecture, we're just going to discuss the termination of the intermediate horn of the sympathetic nervous system at L2. So the sympathetic nervous system that innervates the GI structures is divided into the greater thoracic, the lesser thoracic, and the least thoracic splanchnic nerves. It provides innervation to the blood vessels of the GI tract, the overlying abdominal skin, as well as to the organs themselves. It is often believed that the sympathetic nervous system works in opposition of the parasympathetic nervous system by decreasing blood flow and slowing and inhibiting digestion, which makes sense because in times of fight or flight, when high stress is high, it's important to shunt the blood to the more vital organs like the heart and lungs to aid in this escape mechanism rather than to worry about trying to digest a hamburger. So the first section we're going to talk about is the greater thoracic splanchnic nerves. These originate from cell bodies of T5 to T10 and they carry preganglionic fibers as well as general visceral afferents. It descends through the diaphragm and synapses in the celiac ganglia proximal to the celiac trunk, which is how it got its name. This structure, this sympathetic nervous system, innervates structures of the foregut. And most importantly, it's very important to remember that the adrenal glands, or suprarenal glands, receive innervation from the thoracic, greater thoracic, splanchnic nerves. And it's this structure that helps in that fight or flight and the catecholamine release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And as you can see in this image here, you can see how the greater thoracic, splanchnic nerves descend through the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity around the celiac trunk to provide the structures of the foregut. You know, structures including the duodenum, liver. The next section is the lesser th thoracic splanchnic nerves. This section of the sympathetic nervous system originates of cell bodies of T10 to T12. And they also carry preganglionic fibers and general visceral afferents for sensation to the skin. These fibers synapse in the superior mesenteric ganglion, the SMG. And these fibers function to innervate the abdominal structures of the midgut, structures including the ilium and the jejunum, the distal duodenum, structures in terms of what you may describe the embryological origin of the midgut. The last section is the least thoracic splanchnic nerves. 
And these are sympathetic fibers that also carry preganglionic and general visceral afferents from T12 to L2, and they synapse on the renal ganglia and supply structures including the hindgut, including the kidneys as well. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss the parasympathetic innervation. So the parasympathetic innervation arises from two sets of parasympathetic nerve, nerve fibers. You have the vagus nerve and you have the pelvic splanchnic nerves. So the, four, the, the primary structure of the parasympathetic nerves is what many people consider the function of the GI itself, which is digestion and GI motility. So it's the parasympathetic nerves that are the primary driver for peristalsis and for stimulating digestive secretions. So the parasympathetic vagus nerve supplies what many people consider the majority or the overwhelming amount of the GI structures. All the structures from the esophagus all the way down to pretty much the small intestines. It also even includes a portion of the large intestines. It arises from the medulla, it descends through the mediastinum, splits into two, follows along the esophagus, and then enters into the abdominal cavity, innervating their structures. For the distal structures, the large intestines, the kidneys, the bladder, the sexual organs, all of this parasympathetic innervation comes from the pelvic splanchnic nerves rising from the sacral roots of S2 to S4, not from the vagus nerve directly. So anytime you're thinking of any sort of pelvic organ, pelvic viscera, parasympathetic, think sacral spinal cord. Whether you have a clinical situation that's describing some sort of injury to the sacral spinal cord, think pelvic parasympathetic is being affected. So now we're going to just do a little bit more and talk about the enteric nervous system. So as I described before, the enteric nervous system is this very highly complicated, very intense network of innervation to the GI tract that has the ability to work with or without the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. The enteric nervous system is present in its entirety from the esophagus all the way down to the rectum, and its primary functions include motility, secretion, and autonomic functions. So when we talk about the enteric nervous system, we split up into two sections, the myenteric plexus and the myosinous plexus. The myenteric or our back plexus is pretty much named for where it's located. So if you split the word myenteric into the two words, my meaning muscle, myo meaning muscle in Greek, and enteric for intestines, you pretty much can figure out the location in the GI tract. So it's in the muscular layer of the intestines. It's located between the inner and outer, outer muscularis externa, and it receives both the parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation, and its primary control is GI motility. So the parasympathetic innervation to the myenteric plexus stimulates the smooth muscle contraction, whereas the sympathetic innervation to the myenteric plexus would stimulate an inhibition of the smooth muscles. The submucosal, or the Meisner's plexus, is located in this green layer and is primarily controlling. So the submucosal, or Meisner's plexus, is this green layer right here that's located inside the submucosal and is the primary driver for secretory functions. It only receives innervation from the parasympathetic innervation, in contrast to the myenteric system, which receives both parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. So now we're going to discuss some, some important clinical pearls. So in terms of describing and talking about GM motility, it's important to talk about what postoperative ileus is. So any individuals that have abdominal surgery, it may take some time for the abdominal viscera to return to normal activity and normal function. Whether it's something as simple as a laparoscopic surgery or it's something as severe as an exploratory laparotomy, it takes some time for the GI structures to kind of regain their normal balance. So first off, the small intestines is the first one to usually regain normal function, usually within one day, followed by the stomach in roughly two and the large intestines in three. If it's one week or greater and the and the GI structures are not returning back to normal function, it may lead to a thing called ileus, which is defined as the abdominal organ's inability to maintain normal propulsion or movement or pushing through abdominal contents. And when you have ileus, you're at an increased risk for what's called bowel obstruction, whether it's a partial obstruction or which may lead to a complicated or, or complete obstruction, it may require immediate surgical de decompression. So oftentimes in a clinical setting, it's important to evaluate pretty much where three things as defined here on the right your bowel sounds, which we auscultate for, your air fluid levels, and your abdominal series. With your bowel sounds, you have your normal, which is normal. You have your hyper, hypo, and then absent. This is just a rough generalization. So normal is for normal sounds. Hyper is when you have an acute event, an acute obstruction, and that GI is trying to use all its might to kind of try to push through whatever that obstruction may be. So it's usually a signal for an early, it's usually for an early onset or early 
time point of an obstruction. Then you have hypo, where the GI, in my mind, kind of slows down, gets a little more lethargic, it gets tired, it realizes it can push through the, the obstruction. So it's kind of you know, more mid, mid stage of an obstruction. And then finally, once the obstruction is so significant and it's not able to be pushed past, it, it eventually results in complete absence of bowel sounds, which is significant because it may be a sign of immediate surgical intervention. What's also important to note are air fluid levels. When you have a radiographic imaging or a CT scan, you're going to get air fluid levels that look like this. And I highly encourage many people to go ahead and try to look this up and see what these look like. So if you can imagine if you're like having a sink in your kitchen or in your bathroom, and this is your water, so you're going to get these air fluid levels. So this is the air, this is the fluid in the pipe, and this is the air again. Same thing is happening in your intestinal systems. It's just like the sink underneath your kitchen or your bathroom, where you're going to get these air pockets, and then you're going to get this line right here, this line of demarcation, as it is here, as it is here. This line of demarcation separates the air and the fluid levels. So that's how you know that there's most likely some sort of obstruction that's occurring. And the last point that's important with, with in terms of bowel obstruction is what is abdominal series. You have two uprights and you have one supine. You have your upright chest, you have your upright abdomen, and then you have your supine abdomen. And these are all imaging modalities that are used for x-rays to evaluate what's going on. The upright chest is usually looking for the diaphragm to see if there's any sort of air underneath the diaphragm that signs of some sort of GI perforation. The upper abdominal is also looking again for these air fluid levels to see what's happening there, as well as the supine abdomen is also looking to see what the size of distension or the diameter of, of, these, of the GI structures are. So again, abdominal series, upright chest, upright abdomen, and supine abdomen. So in terms of enteric nervous system, it's also important to talk about referred pain and what that is. So referred pain is essentially describing pain that's sensed by the somatic afferents of the peritoneum in relation to its, its irritation from the underlying abdominal organs. So for example, when you have appendicitis, the appendix is first localized in the periumbilical region and it's diffuse, it's hard to point to, and you really can't tell where it is exactly. You just know that it's this gnawing pain. What happens over time is once the appendix, which is located more or less right here, it starts to irritate this overlying peritoneum, the peritoneal layer, which is somatic innervation. And because it has somatic information, you could be able to point right to this area. So what happens is that this pain over time actually starts to migrate over to this right area, which is called the McBurney's point, which is located about one-third from your aces to your belly button, so one-third this way is where you would find McBurney's point. So the liver and the gallbladder are located in the right upper quadrant. So as you can imagine, when you have prolonged irritation or irritation overlying the diaphragm, pain can be sensed in the right upper quadrant as well as referred to the right shoulder. So again, if you suspect anything in here, both anterior and posterior, as well as some overlying right upper quadrant pain, then you most likely are going to think some sort of liver or gallbladder pathology. There's also important a clinical finding called Murphy sign, which often indicates some sort of gallbladder pathology, and that is occurs when you palpate the gallbladder, or you most likely you palpate the right upper quadrant, which causes irritation of the diaphragm and results in significant pain and temporary cessation upon inhalation. So you just ask the person to breathe normally. You palpate the right upper quadrant. As they inhale, you press down. If they stop breathing, then you think Murphy sign positive, some sort of gallbladder pathology. So then when you have the spleen, spleen is located over here in the left side of the left upper quadrant. And when you have referred pain, this referred pain is usually present in the clavicle, the left clavicle region. And this is called Kerr sign from the spleen. And this is when you have irritation of the diaphragm or irritation of the overlying peritoneum caused by a similar innervation of the phrenic nerve C3 to C5. So both the C3 to C5 and the supraclavicular nerves both share the same nerve roots and can cause the same sensation or same pain. Next you have the stomach and pancreas. So the stomach and pancreas are both located you know, centrally to the epigastric region. The pancreas is not visible in this image. However, they both share very similar pain sensations. It's usually considered to be epigastric, the middle of the stomach, or maybe sometimes, you know, inferior substernal pain. And it often can radiate and localize to the back. It's very difficult for you to get comfortable, and it's often hard to distinguish what stomach pain and, and pancreatic pain may be. Then you have the kidneys. So the kidneys are retroperitoneal structures that are usually very intimate with the posterior abdominal wall. 
whenever you have inflammation, infection, or any type of bleed that's associated with the with the kidneys, you actually may get blood to settle, or you may get irritation along the lateral sides of the wall of the of the trunk, and it may radiate all the way down to the lateral legs or even in the suprapubic region. This pain is usually more diffuse. It covers a very great distance, often called flank pain, and can range anywhere from the mid back, lower back, complete size, or even sometimes front lateral sides. So it just depends, but oftentimes if you think pain on your upper mid-back down into your suprapubic area, you're most likely going to try to think this is probably more of a kidney-related process. So again, you're just going to expect the pain to kind of radiate more along like this direction, almost as if it's just following down to the ureters, you know, flank pain, groin pain. That's that's what you can th- consider to be kidney-referred pain. So also in terms of GI motility and GI function and the enteric nervous system, it's very important that we discuss what is Hirschsprung's disease. So Hirschsprung's disease is a congenital disorder in which the myenteric neurons in the GI system are absent. They're not present in the colon. This is where your cecum starts, ascending, transverse, descending, and then your descending becomes your sigmoid and then rectum anus. So what happens here is neural crest cells are what actually are the origination, embryological origination for the myenteric nerves. What happens if these neural crest cells fail to migrate and descend into the colon, you actually get segment that is aganglionic. So what happened is this is all normal. This is all normal colon. Everything's normal here. And then right here you see this very narrow, constricted, empty portion of the colon. This is an aganglionic segment with no myenteric nerves. So it's the inability to actually push food contents stools through the rest and remainder of the colon. So what happens is these individuals are very susceptible to small bowel obstructions, large bowel obstructions. They're very susceptible to pretty much partial and complete obstructions. There's no way to actually cure this absent a gang on a segment. The only important, the only way you can is you actually have to, to remove this portion of the colon and sometimes have to put a colostomy in depending on how far back this ascends. So what happens is when you do have this ganglion, this, this starts to dilate. You actually end up getting a very large colon and almost looks like a megacolon to a certain extent just because of the fact that there's so much fecal contents that are clogging up proximal to this, this distal aganglionic segment. What's also important to note is what's called a squirt sign positive. So a squirt sign positive is literally where you stick your finger into the anus of an infant and if you have fecal contents or meconium pass out then you know that it's most likely Hirschsprung's because it has inability to push it through. If you stick your finger through the anus of an infant and it fails to produce any sort of feces at all then you're thinking that this is cystic fibrosis because cystic fibrosis is where you have very thick dry stools that it gets stuck in the colon and cannot come through. So that's when you think cystic fibrosis. So if you squirt sign positive and feces comes squirting out, Hirschsprung's. If it does not, cystic fibrosis. Thank you again, and that concludes the enteric nervous system in Chapter 4 of the Abdomen.